think I have to just agree. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and um, thank you very much for joining us this Sunday morning. We felt it was very, very good to get all of our members together just to kind of think about what's happened this year and, and, and thinking a little bit more about what's what's coming up over the following months. Obviously, the last 15 months have been a challenge both personally and professionally for a lot of the industry partners that we have, but we're looking forward to better times ahead and to coming together in a very proactive and um, you know cohesive way so that we can advance um, our thinking and the outcomes for the blockchain industries in our respective um, sectors and uh, jurisdictions. Um, today, I just wanted to kind of welcome you all, as I said, to this meeting, because obviously thinking a little bit more uh, strategically about what it is that the British Blockchain Association can do um, and does and, and will be supporting our members um, with going forward. So obviously just wanted to kind of uh, reiterate that we have as a group really created an amazing network and a, a supportive network, I would say, and an influential network of, of blockchain leaders, influencers, and professionals. Obviously, in such a fast developing and, and advancing industry such as ours, we also want to make sure that everybody's voice is heard and that all of our respective learnings have a centralized point from which we can kind of then both uh, offer our insights, our industry side insights to our regulatory and government partners so that we can actually make sure that our advances are not only transparent to those that are making regulatory decisions on, 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 on what it is that we're doing, but we can kind of engage in a, in a very um, transparent and interactive process so that not the industry and the regulatory bodies can work together to forward um, what we feel to be an incredible uh, point in time with our industry. I think um, a big part of this type of conversation, and, and Nassim will talk about this um, and has talked about this in quite some depth, is obviously the development of the, um, the national blockchain roadmap and the fact that the British Blockchain Association members have a very unique uh, uh, and valuable part to play in this. And through ourselves, we are the kind of information conduits that will make sure that all of the um, ambitious, but we feel realistic um, milestones that we plan to reach as part of that roadmap can be achieved um, by creating this, this point of dialogue. And the British Blockchain Association is very much that the, the kind of the forum where all of our all of our kind of big thinkers our inspirational um, technology developers, our um, you know, commercially minded you know, people that, that, that can really see the potential of our technology, we all come together and then we will help um, as, a, as, a, as a proactive group to make great things happen over the coming years. Being a part of the British Blockchain Association and being a member of the association allows our members to have a piece and a part of the voice and uh, be part of the decision making going forward. So that is very much um, something that we're very proud of. And obviously Nassim can talk in a little bit more detail later on, later on as to how things are developing on that score. As, as a kind of membership, um, as a kind of core part of the British Blockchain Association in essence, we everything we do is very much um, grounded in evidence-based findings and we, make all sensible suggestions and we report and educate on the basis of um, absolutely best, best in breed findings and scientifically evidenced um, realities. So as, as part of the kind of membership of the British Blockchain Association, being able to tap into the academic, the academic rigor um, that our senior scientists and academics um, obviously kind of their discoveries, we in turn then as members that either work in the academic space or work in the commercial space, we have the benefit of these findings. And again, as a kind of, as part of that, our kind of, our membership group, we're very, very lucky to have that. So I think Nassim Bey would be, and obviously we have our, our JBBA, the academic journal, 
and our sponsors and partners have the ability to have visibility there either as a kind of um, as a with their scientific papers or from the point of view of uh, branding and awareness so with over 1 million readers in various you know in, in all of the different um, seats of learning seats of government around the world we're very very lucky and and very honored to have this publication that our key members and any any of our key members that, that do want to be published obviously have to go through our the, the kind of rather rigorous process with our a journalistic board but there is an amazing opportunity to to present your findings and your work in a very influential way through the journal um and as part of the jbpa um kind of mission to bring documented excellence to the world uh, bba members can have that option uh, as well and we encourage people to think about what they would like to publish over the coming months and years and always consider um, submitting your papers and your findings to us so that we can we can then review that and try and help you get your voice to the world. Okay, Nassim, I think that's that's me as a, as a kind of an opening start. We very much look forward to many, many more great events ahead. Obviously, we have the, the ISC, the International Scientific Conference. We have our work with the Blockchain Associations Forum, which is the kind of more the, 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 the part of what we do, which has the global reach. We're very proud to be spearheading that. And I think over time, we will see our core membership of the BBA grow, and then we will then be encouraging people in turn to think about the Blockchain Associations Forum and the benefits that that has as well. But we welcome you all and thank you very much for your membership. And we look forward to uh, connecting with you, engaging with you, and who knows, maybe even meeting in person at some point over the next months. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, Deborah has uh, been a part of the BBA for uh, some time now. She's done some really fantastic work. So I would like to thank her again. And I would like to thank you all for joining on, on, on Sunday. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you an overview of the UK's National uh, Blockchain Roadmap Excellence Framework. Uh, and uh, this was published uh, recently by the British Blockchain Association uh, in collaboration with the UK uh, All Party Parliamentary Group on Blockchain. And roadmaps are important. Uh, you need roadmaps if you want to go somewhere. Um, you need to have very clear goals uh, as a nation, as a region where you are heading in terms of um, the technology and, um, uh, and, and its uh, key objectives. So um, UK was a uh, pioneer uh, when it comes to exploration of blockchain technologies, researching and producing uh, reports as early as 2015, 2016. And what these reports uh, highlighted is the need for treating blockchain as a scientific discipline and making sure that frameworks um, are, are based on, on evidence as we would do in, in, in all other scientific disciplines. And here is a quote from 2015 report uh, from Sir Mark Walpert, advancing better science that is research backed and peer reviewed. Um, then there was a report published in 2017 and then another one in 2018. Uh, which was uh, published in the JBPA. So here's the, here's the roadmap. It's open access, it's on our website. You may have read it. Um, I want to highlight some, some key recommendations. What's relevant uh, to note here is that this is, I believe, the, the world's first blockchain roadmap in which all recommendations are based on scientific research outputs. Um, now, it's important that we build ecosystems uh, in not just in blockchain, but in, in any other technology in a very collaborative way. So this is a quadruple helix innovation model where uh, we work with government, academia, industry, and society together for the advancement of technology. And we are, we are well aware of the challenges we have seen uh, working in silos. 
Recently, there's an example of the infrastructure bill in the US where there seems to be some disconnect between what the industry representatives were saying and what the government was saying. Similarly, we have seen an, another example where there's a disconnect between society and industry uh, in terms of um, Bitcoin mining, for example, where one group is saying that Bitcoin mining is green, 70% of the mining is green and so on. And, and then the anthropologists and society is saying it's, it's harmful for the society and so on. So I think there, is a, there seems to be a disconnect. And there are, there are many, many other examples. So a bulk of our work is uh, with, our, uh, with our partners, including government representatives and industry bodies and universities, is to work in, in, in collaboration, not just in the UK, but also globally, to advance and foster this quadruple helix uh, and establish best practices standards to, uh, to advocate these extended knowledge networks, such as the Center for Evidence-Based uh, Blockchain. Some of you are part of it. Uh, it is a world's first center for evidence-based practice for blockchain. Um, now, the technology is, is, is advancing at a breathtaking pace. We have seen the developments of NFTs uh, in the recent months, DeFi and, and DAO's Lightning Network and, and, and so on. So we propose the formation of subspecialty interest groups because we believe that just one body uh, uh, cannot, is not in a position to, uh, to debate and discuss and explore everything. You need, uh, you need individualized uh, you know, a policy uh, which are targeted at the emerging, emerging technologies and other subspecialty disciplines. So we are currently inviting organizations to be a part of it. This is a, this is a 2030 roadmap and we will be producing reports and, and outputs at regular intervals. So if, you, if your organization wish to participate, we would, we would welcome to hear from you. You don't need to be necessarily in the UK, it could be anywhere. And um, this is on your right hand side of the screen, you see, for example, a crypto asset, some specialty group um, with, uh, with multi-stakeholder collaboration. This is an example of what a subspecialty group might look like. So for example, if you want to discuss the use of a blockchain for voting, you could uh, look at which countries have already explored it. What are the different blockchains? What are the outcomes? <clears throat> Impact is, is important. Uh, we know that uh, there is a lot of uh, talk recently on how do we measure the societal impact of blockchain applications has been around for more than a decade. So how do we know that the programs are working and are making a societal impact? How do we know that a blockchain-based system work more efficiently than a legacy system? So I think it's important that all uh, DLT-based interventions should be reviewed over time. And uh, we propose these eight um, uh, domains where uh, we think that blockchain can make a significant impact. It's already making an impact. The institutions we know are awarded uh, based on the impact that they have created, whether it is academic or societal. In the UK, we have research excellence framework where around 30% of the funding any university or public institution receive is, is based on demonstration of impact. So it makes sense that we measure it and we audit it. Um, we have proposed uh, certain frameworks in in the past, including the uh, PCIO framework, the evidence-based blockchain uh, uh, frameworks in terms of uh, how do we assess and measure uh, evidence, how to find evidence. And um, the, the results have shown that uh, less than 2% of uh, enterprises uh, actually demonstrate evidence of impactful outcomes backed by scientific evidence. So it's very important that we make frameworks uh, that are based on, on evidence. This is another example. It's, a, it's already a published case study in the JBBA where the use of blockchain has been studied in, in agriculture and farming. Uh, it was also featured in the BBC. So evidence-based blockchain is already happening. A case study is already being conducted using its frameworks. Another uh, recommendation is 
to um, look at the use of blockchain for, uh, for delivering the United Nations uh, goals. Um, this, this study was again recently published in the JBBA looking at industrial symbiosis networks, which is basically the use of waste of one product, uh, one organization as a raw material for another. So um, it showed that using ISNs can already benefit um, uh, the economy at 1.8 trillion euros by 2030. So there are many, many examples of uh, emerging of using of blockchain for these development goals. Um, another important area where uh, blockchain could benefit is the use of distributed ledgers for government and public services. This is a case study which was uh, published, uh, authored by the Companies House UK, which is a government department um, for registering uh, all the uh, limited companies and businesses uh, information. So if you want to start a, a company in the UK, you have to register uh, your, your business or your organization uh, at Companies House. So Companies House looked at um, how blockchain could be used uh, as an infrastructure for, um, for managing the, the data, sharing information with other public services uh, for legal entities, mitigating fraud and so on. And so there are 20 recommendations. Uh, obviously I don't have time to go through all, the, all these 20. Uh, as I said, they are available on the website. Um, how you could contribute to the, to, the, to the blockchain roadmap and the subspecialty group, drop us an email, uh, specify the domain that you wish to contribute to and, and apply to become a member of the association. We are planning to uh, publish uh, the first report uh, by the uh, end of next year. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. And I would now like to invite uh, my colleague, uh, Steve Vallas, CEO, Blockchain Australia, uh, to uh, tell us more about Australia's national roadmaps, any challenges and the work uh, Steve is doing at Blockchain Australia. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Sam. I appreciate this opportunity to talk to the to the group tonight. And listening uh, over just a few minutes to yourself and to, and to Deborah, all, all I hear is shared experience at the moment. So it's an interesting thing to hear about the way these things need to be communicated. And, and in many respects, the work that's being done is not being recognised outside of um, the domains, outside of academia, for example. People aren't appreciating how much is being done so I think it's incumbent upon us and, and much of what's happening in Australia is to go into rooms other than our own and, and to talk about what's, uh, what's happening in, uh, in academia, um, in business and in government. Uh, as, uh, as Nassim mentioned, my name's Steve Vallis. I'm the CEO of Blockchain Australia. I have been in this role for approximately 14 months. The organisation has been around for a long time. We have the benefit of uh, quite a number of years of uh, Blockchain Australia being in existence, there's a level of maturity I think that in many jurisdictions the associations have struggled with and, and we benefit from having been involved in the ecosystem from a very early stage. We have members, uh, approximately 100 members at the moment is a paid organisation to be a part of. We see value in what we deliver and for that reason we, we ask for membership fees to be contributed and I think importantly as part of the way this ecosystem has developed, our membership is wide ranging. We have uh, academia, we have tertiary institutions, we have enterprise businesses, we have startups, we have DCEs and, and VASPs. There's a broad range. And I think that's been important given the cadence of the way the ecosystem has, has run. I think importantly, if I go back to 2017 first, and I'll very quickly go through in a matter of minutes, 2017, Australia observed from a distance much of what was happening. We advocated I think with regulators, but we didn't really participate in much of that. We watched it, we, we, we participated in some measure. What was really an important and sort of critical step in Australia's evolution in the blockchain space was government standing up and saying, we're going to put together a national blockchain roadmap. It was a very strong signal and it was delivered by the Department of Industry, probably the right department for us to kick the conversation off because they didn't have the vested interest. The Department of Industry as the name suggests, is there for industry, it's there for jobs, it's there for growth. Um, it's in large respects inoffensive in the sense that it's there for the betterment of the country in, in many of its pursuits. So that's where it was launched and spoken about in 2019. Um, what ended up happening from that was it was released in February 2020. And I think 
what's important in the way the ecosystem developed was there was a level of conservatism in the choices that were made by the Department of Industry. It gave us a firm footing. They chose supply chain, uh, they chose credentials, they chose reg tech and cyber security. Cyber security in large part hasn't been taken up at pace because of the investments that's required sort of federally top down. There's a lot of investment required and given the threats that cyber poses to, to nation states, it's been a difficult subject matter. The other two, sorry, the other three have continued in earnest and they were a safe space, I think, for the ecosystem to develop. Supply chains in particular, given Australia's sort of history and our geographic proximity means it was a very good place for us to start this, this conversation and that's continued to to sort of grow. So over the course of 2020, um, that familiarity, the home that was ultimately the Department of Industry, and I've otherwise said it's this subject matter generally doesn't have a home in, in Australia. There are no departments that have owned it. Um, no business has necessarily embraced it. We needed somewhere to put some roots in, and those roots were, were housed in the Department of Industry. We built upon that over the course of uh, 2020. And as we went in and spoke about this subject matter, it made things less scary in large part. What's ended up happening is as we pushed into the bank of 2020 and then into 2021, there's been a move and partially driven by what we're doing at Blockchain Australia to bring the ecosystem that is supply chain and credentials and reg tech closer to the financial services side. So the recognition that cryptocurrencies aren't a dirty word, digital assets aren't a dirty word. And I think this separation serves to a period of time to a point, but then ultimately this subject better needs to come back together because all I hear in the rooms I'm in now is, is reg tech and the regulation and the regulatory frameworks. Every jurisdiction I speak to, and I speak to many people across many jurisdictions, the, the consistent theme now is, is regulation. So it's almost a sign of the maturing of the ecosystem that we all sit here and now say, how do the regulations sort of play? So if we flash forward now to close to where we are in, in April, uh, Blockchain Australia put on the first uh, Blockchain Week initiative. We had over a million impressions over three or four days. We had 10,000 people sign up for sessions. It was an extraordinarily successful event in that it elevated the subject matter to a point where it felt mainstream. And that was kind of the main game for us. We said to the academics, come out of academia and talk to the mainstream. We said to supply chain business, come out of that domain and talk to the mainstream as we did with, with government and with the financial services businesses. So it was an inflection point, a tipping point for I think the strategy that Australia has been developing. In recent days, there is a Senate committee at the moment which is tasked with giving consideration to where this fits, where digital assets fit, or where cryptocurrency fits. So we're at a formative stage and it's been interesting for us from here, we see what's happening around the world. I follow with interest what's happening at the FCA, we watch what's happening with MICA, we look into Singapore, we look into the US, it's time we put the stake in the ground and ultimately made a decision about how these things fit into financial products, commodities, utility tokens and the like. So that's what our submission ultimately was and has been to government. We've now said, we think the infrastructure is, is almost set. We are open for business in, in the respect that we have resources here that don't seek to move away. You know, there's no need for brain drains for jurisdictions. This borderless opportunity means that we think we're as well-placed as anybody else. So we've gone to government now and said in, a, in a, a relatively forceful manner, we need to make a decision. Can we make a decision about where we sort of sit now? So that history is a reflection of initial sitting on the sidelines, 2019, providing a safe foundation of subject matter that allowed people to feel comfortable to speak to where we were. Ultimately now, a conversation that says, where do these assets fit? Where do these conversations fit? And I expect that over the coming six months, Australia will move forward quickly or not. And, and either way, I think it sets the scene for where we are 12, 24 and 36 months from, from now. So that's the scene setting of, of where this all is. Uh, from Blockchain Australia's perspective now, uh, we're looking to go into all of these different areas and effectively take the component parts of the ecosystem and map the ecosystem. We, we want supply chain businesses to understand they intersect with uh, financial services businesses and trade finance. We, we want government departments to know that they cannot be siloed. And it was a critical word in the same that it mentioned the siloed nature of these conversations does not serve government. So I've said in a very deliberate way to government, I can't have conversations six times with government departments. We need six government departments to sit together to understand the implications of this subject matter. We need business to sit together to understand this, uh, the implications of this subject matter. So we're in a very exciting time. I'm, I'm as bullish as I've ever been about the general subject matter, but also realistic enough to know that, that much of the challenge is stakeholder management. Uh, and uh, you need to give people some comfort before they're willing to move forward. So at pace, 
uh, that's what we're doing. We're moving forward as quickly as possible. So that's a lay of the land of the Australian ecosystem. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. That was an excellent story. And I think the, the, the message is very clear, as Steve said, this is, this is a common theme. We have to work together. We have to work uh, collaboratively, involve all stakeholders. Otherwise, we, we keep coming back and keep making the same mistakes as, as, as we have seen in the past. So I think uh, important that uh, we have a multi-stakeholder uh, discussion an early discussion and early collaboration um, before uh, we we reach to a point where we realize that essential components uh, were missing or were not taken on board. So I think I think this is a very very message. So I would like to uh, thank Steve again for his uh, contribution uh, today. Uh, moving on uh, very quickly, um, this is what the BB ecosystem looks like. So we have we have seven components. Uh, I've discussed about the National Blockchain Roadmap, uh, our peer-reviewed journal, uh, Center for Evidence-Based Blockchain, the Think Tank Hub, Scientific Conference, Fellowships, Student Forums, and uh, the Blockchain Associations Forum. Um, the journal is a, a peer-reviewed scientific journal. It's the world's first journal that's available both in print on, and online on blockchain. We have uh, advisors and editors in uh, in uh, in more than 63 countries, uh, editorial board of more than 250 uh, professors and senior academics, as well as industry leaders. And the journal is indexed in more than 200 libraries. And uh, we also send print copies to uh, universities, industries, enterprises, and blockchain thought leaders in, uh, in 107 countries. So um, the journal is, is op open access. Uh, there is no fee to read it, uh, read the articles. It's fully online, open access. And um, uh, you can go and search and read some of the uh, publications, the research work that has been published recently. The issue is on track for November. And uh, uh, we, uh, we are working with our members and partners um, uh, on, on another successful uh, launch of the eighth issue. Um, <clears throat> Center for Evidence-Based Blockchain now has uh, 11 universities and uh, 15 institutional members, corporations um, as members. We have um, an, an online forum as well where we connect and discuss uh, latest developments and, uh, and the emerging trends. Scientific Con uh, is in March next year. Call for submissions are open. So if you have, uh, if you know someone who is working on a groundbreaking project, want to submit their work to the, uh, to the uh, conference, please uh, inform them, tell them to do so. Um, it's going to be held online. So you don't need to travel, no need to spend money on, on flights and hotels. You can present your work from comfort of your own home. We award uh, fellowships to uh, people who have made excellent contributions to the field of blockchain. Professor Cole from Fordham University is our recent fellow appointed recently. And um, if you know someone who has made substantial and significant contribution to the field of blockchain, please do nominate them. I'm going to now invite uh, Dr. Solomon Uagbole, who is our regional advisor for uh, Nigeria. He has been a part of uh, the BBA for some time he was appointed last year as uh, an advisor for the Center for Evidence-Based Blockchain. And he has done some, uh, some really important work uh, by working with uh, uh, local leaders in Africa and also uh, in collaboration with the Commonwealth. Um, this was the uh, event that we hosted uh, last year. Solomon is going to tell you more about his work, uh, both in Africa and also uh, his connections in the UK. So um, over to you, Solomon. Can you hear us? Uh, good morning. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, uh, can you unshare your screen? Uh, that is uh, Dr. Nassim. Yeah, hang on. Uh, yes. Okay. okay. Okay, right. Let me try again. Right. 
What's this? Who can share this? Holy host. Um, my sharing is still disabled. Solomon, I've made you a host, so you should be able to share it now. Okay, so, right. Uh, it's not coming. It's coming with advanced options. Let me try again. No. Okay, so it's better now. Okay, that's that is great. Uh, just uh, give me... Okay, I hope uh, you can see my screen. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, again, good morning all. Uh, I'm Dr. Solomon Wagbole, uh, BBA Regional Advisor, Nigeria. I work in the area of uh, AI and uh, uh, blockchain. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, done quite a lot in Africa. And last year we had um, a conference uh, which was uh, attended and we had pre uh, presenters, um, uh, uh, keynote presenters uh, in different fields. Uh, we had uh, uh, Dr. Roja Korantek, uh, Professor Undubisi Kikwe, uh, Dr. Nassim himself, and we also expected uh, Paul Izefulu um, that was uh, that very day was a challenging day for Nigeria, so he couldn't make it, but he was in briefly. Um, so the essence of these um, activities in Nigeria, as you all know, blockchain, uh, the new frontier of blockchain is in Africa. Uh, Nigeria actually ranked very high in cryptocurrency trading and uh, blockchain applications. Um, so we apply the evidence-based uh, methodology, um, as you have seen in uh, Dr. Nassim's slides, uh, the PICO or the uh, PCIO uh, methodology in blockchain projects. Um, throughout, uh, through the year, we've done quite a lot with the uh, Commonwealth African Anti-Corruption Center, and which is a collaboration uh, between the uh, Commonwealth Office London, the African Development Bank, and the government of uh, Botswana. Uh, we had a we had a three days training on applying blockchain uh, to look at corruption issues, uh, supply chain, which is uh, my area. Um, we also did um, a conference uh, with the, uh, I presented at the Commonwealth Conference uh, where the stakeholders of anti-corruption agency across Africa uh, actually came together and looked at um, how to use um, blockchain to resolve uh, some of those issues of uh, uh, corruptions and uh, supply chain. Then we've also uh, done a lot in awareness. Uh, these days, traditional media does, doesn't go far. Um, the digital media and influencers as what goes far. Uh, that is me and Asim, they're appearing in Con, uh, Coins News Extra. And uh, for those of you who are online or LinkedIn, you may have seen who is who in blockchain actually appearing in this uh, channel, which is based in uh, Nigeria. Um, we've also, through the conference as well, I was in contact with the stakeholders in Blockchain Technology Association of Nigeria, which is actually one of the um, um, known body in Nigeria actually regulating um, and also providing input to uh, the blockchain activities in Nigeria. There are other bodies, uh, but uh, most other bodies also belong to the CIBA. And uh, the good news, CIBA is also a part of us in the Blockchain um, Association Forum. Um, then, um, as I've said at the very beginning, um, uh, the new frontiers of uh, blockchains and, uh, and apps, which include uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, is in, in Africa. So there's quite a lot uh, that's going on there. Uh, thanks, all of you. I have five minutes for my presentation. I just want to keep uh, to time. And uh, that's my email there. I'm on LinkedIn. And uh, uh, so 
Uh, thanks again uh, for the time. Thank you very much, uh, Solomon. You are welcome. So next we have uh, some uh, member updates. Uh, Arzu Torren from Erin Strategy. Uh, Arzu, can you hear us? Hello. Hello, yes, Arzu, please go ahead. Uh, hello, hello. Um, very nice uh, to see all of you. Uh, really pleased to participate to BBA forum today. Um, can you see me, by the way? Okay, let me. Ah, hello. Hi. Um, so yes, my name I can is. I see you, Arzu. Thank yes, you. yes. Uh, my name is Arzu Toran. I'm the uh, founder and managing director of Erin Strategy. Erin Strategy um, is a, a, a consulting company based in London. We provide services in management strategy, uh, management consulting, strategy development, and digital transformation with special focus on blockchain-based applications. So we help organizations um, to, um, uh, to design, develop, and implement solutions to strengthen their competitive advantages and enhance their performances. The mission of the company is to drive the implementation of disruptive technologies through various industries and various applications uh, with the vision to, uh, to uh, be able to create a financial system which empowers people. Uh, my personal background is in international banking. I spent more than 20 years working uh, in commercial banks in Turkey and in Europe. Uh, as a relationship manager for global financial institutions uh, covering developed and emerging markets. My uh, main uh, responsibilities uh, include the trade finance business, um, international borrowing and lending, uh, payments, uh, and asset trading. In 2017, uh, I did uh, an academic research about blockchain during my um, MBA studies in London. And after that, I decided to uh, change my direction to work in this field where I can converge technology and finance and uh, make some contribution to the ecosystem. So blockchain is moving from uh, conceptual projects to deployments, and it is really exciting uh, to take active role in this ecosystem uh, that uh, enables, uh, which enables that. In Aaron's strategy, we work with um, corporates, technology providers, startups and also collaborate with larger consultancy companies. Uh, we help them uh, establish uh, the roadmap uh, for their uh, governance and product design, uh, engage with clients, uh, present to investors as well. We also uh, provide content. Uh, we participate to the uh, publishings in the ecosystem by providing content uh, for industry reports. And in the next phase of our activities, our aim is to take uh, more active roles in projects related to central bank digital currencies, um, issues of bank tokens and DeFi projects. Uh, uh, we are open to collaboration, cooperation with any organization where we can create tangible value. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arzu, thank you. Okay, next we have uh, is our regional updates. And um, I'm very thankful to Professor Shukla, who is our uh, regional advisor for Center for Evidence-Based Blockchain uh, in Kanpur, India. He's also uh, an editor for cryptography section at the JBBA. So um, I've asked uh, Sandeep to give us a very brief overview of his work uh, with the National Blockchain Project and some key, um, key updates uh, from India. So over to you, Sandeep, thank you. All right, can I sh <coughs> share my screen, please? Uh. Yeah.
All right. Uh, so can you see my screen? So I am going to talk about the National Blockchain Project, uh, which is the project that is, uh, uh, you know, I can show you our mission is to, you know, to develop e-governance solutions using blockchain technology. And we are currently in the phase three of the project. So it's the project started in 2018, March, and it was funded by the uh, National Security Council Secretariat of the Prime Minister's Office of India. And our goal is to actually provide a solution to various e-governance problems uh, that uh, initially, uh, at the very beginning, we actually started talking to the government of Uttar Pradesh, where my institute is located. And uh, they wanted to do a you know, land registry solution on blockchain. But uh, this particular state is very uh, slow and uh, we are uh, still talking after three years. And in the meantime, the government of Karnataka, which is where Bangalore is located, uh, they actually uh, 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 propose that we do their uh, land registry uh, on blockchain and we have completed the solution and uh, it is going to be rolled out. It was supposed to be rolled out this uh, uh, last week, but uh, apparently the smart cards that are required for, uh, you know, for uh, providing the uh, identity and the, actually through, through the, uh, you know, private key of the users is supposed to be uh, prepared in the UK uh, before they are, uh, 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 I mean, they are shipped here. So therefore, uh, it's been delayed by a couple of weeks. So we are hoping that next month, it will be rolled out district by district. And then uh, in the meantime, the government of Karnataka also uh, wanted us to do their e-procurement uh, uh, solution, which is currently a centralized solution with number of different problems with respect to uh, the biddings and the uh, and the way the uh, uh, orders are placed, etc. So, so we are uh, about to start working on that. Uh, there is another uh, uh, ministry in the in the state of Uttar Pradesh has recently uh, uh, given us some funding for their agro um, uh, ministry, agricultural ministry, for keeping track of uh, certain subsidies. Uh, that are provided to the farmers. So that's the current situation. And uh, as I said that, uh, you know, the, this phase one, phase two, and phase three, phase three is when we are supposed to actually do the implementations. Phase one and phase two was mostly research and uh, figuring out uh, various solutions, comparing different blockchains, etc. So we have this execution company called Proven which is a company uh, incubated at uh, the Indian Institute of Technology Kanpur, which is our institute. And this is where uh, we actually do uh, or take up all these projects that I was talking about. So here is a Kruban's website. Now Kruban, other than doing this uh, blockchain uh, property registration, and uh, we also are talking to the government about the uh, centralized health uh, uh, you know, identity. So it's, there is a health ID project that was uh, mooted by the prime minister uh, last year. And that particular one that uh, requires some consent mechanism. And we have been, we have a solution, prototype solution for blockchain based consent management. So we have been talking to them. In the meantime, we just uh, released last week, the self-sovereign identity solution that we have, uh, 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 you know, developed. And this uh, uh, website, I would request uh, you to actually look at. So the idea here is that, uh, so currently uh, what happens in India is that suppose you have, you have multiple identity documents that are provided to you by different entities, including the government. For example, we have the unique uh, uh, identification project that is the Aadhaar. And then we have the, uh, the tax uh, identification card called PAN card. And then we have the uh, uh, 
uh, currently uh, the university issued uh, certificates or university issued uh, identify uh, identification document and then now we also are all are having this uh, vaccine uh, vaccination documents uh, and then there could be other like your school living certificates and other things so what happens now is that if you want to prove to somebody that you are above 18 or you are a senior citizen above 65, then you have to basically give a copy of a Xerox copy of the document to the other party. And that has led to multiple different frauds that uh, take place because those documents then uh, again reused for, um, you know, various kinds of services, uh, including getting a SIM card in your name, etc. So therefore, uh, the idea here is that all these documents will be, will actually be in you know all the elements of this document will be individually signed, uh, digitally signed by the uh, the document uh, the issuer of the document, and then our wallet is going to come uh, this this uh, this uh, uh, you know individually signed entities will come to our document. And then the entire thing will also be signed uh, into our wallet. And then we can actually choose what to give and what not to give and how much of a particular document to give. Since these are going to be signed by these entities, uh, it will be easy to verify that these are genuine uh, you know, uh, claims about my identity, about my age, or my, my phone number, or my uh, uh, address. Uh, or my blood group, uh, or any kind of medical condition I might have, everything will be individually signed and then accordingly provided. And in some cases, you don't even need to give the entire information. For example, to prove that you are above 18, you don't have to give the entire birth date or year. All you have to give is a proof. So, so we have also implemented zero knowledge proof system. So, so you can actually make certain claims and, and provide zero knowledge proof to the verifier which they cannot um, you know, uh, deny because uh, it, is, it is going to be actually uh, a zero knowledge proof with the right kind of uh, uh, you know, signature, et cetera. So that is what we are very excited about this uh, currently. And we are talking to various entities, uh, uh, government entities, educational entities, healthcare entities, et cetera. We are also talking to the central bank, the Reserve Bank of India, to see if this can also be used as a KYC, but it turns out that to do that, there are certain uh, legal provisions that needs to be updated. Uh, so, so it's it's uh, technology was the easy part. What is more difficult uh, is the regulatory, legal, and other uh, infrastructural issues, and talking to the various entities uh, and and get them a buy-in into this technology. So. So that's where we are. Uh, so I, I would, uh, since the time is less, I will not take more time. But uh, I think that uh, if you go to this proven.com and blockchain.csc.iit.ac.in, you can get further information. So I'll, I'll leave at that. Thank you very much, uh, Sandeep. Uh... Just one question regarding um, interoperability of these you know, various systems, as you said, technology is the easy part. So once yeah. you have this app and you have got your KYC and identity, everything approved, then how are you finding this onboarding various public departments to join this network so that they all talk to each other? Is it difficult? Yeah, yeah, it is very difficult, um, you know, the. Uh, the usually it is not so difficult to uh, convince the top person on the uh, like the uh, uh, top bureaucrats and etc but then there is a whole lot of friction from the lower uh, lower rung of the uh, things and that is the uh, biggest problem we have thankfully in the state of karnataka this is much less but in the state of uttar pradesh for example it is much much more friction and also there are some vested interests because some of these things will bring such transparency that there are a lot of uh, ways they make money cannot be actually uh, uh, done anymore. Uh, you know, illicit methods of making money by uh, twisting the customer's uh, 
uh, hands, etc. So that's that's something that uh, yeah. is going to be challenging, and and we are trying to address that given that the top level persons are usually uh, uh, usually their engineers or, or like IAS officers. Uh, so they actually understand what we are talking about and how it will uh, help, but uh, especially in transparency and trust. But in terms of um, you know getting help from the people who will actually do the uh, actual implementation of these uh, interfaces, uh, that's sometimes getting hard. Yes, yes, indeed. Oh, excellent. Um, so I think we have no more questions. Um, we thought we just make it a little bit of kind of uh, to conclude the session. Uh, every month, we will give one free uh, entry to ISC. So leading up to ISC to March, I think we have maybe we will give away six or seven um, tickets. So what what I've got here is, is a lot of these chits with all the different names of people who registered. And um, I'm going to I'm going to pick two from here, and I'm going to ask, uh, let's say Sandeep. So Sandeep, uh, you can see my hands, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Which one do you want? Which one do you want me to to pick? So the this is my right hand. One, one on your left, left hand. One on your left. Uh, so your my left. left hand is it this one? Ah, uh, yes. This one? Yeah. This one you want me to pick? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. I'll put this one down. Marcus Lehtonen. Marcus, congratulations. You are, I think you are in the participants. So, yes. and just to be fair, just to make sure that I've not put Marcus on every chit. <laughs> this is this, this is Magnus Jones. This is Dan Tacky. These are all different. So anyways, Marcus, you have won a complimentary kit to ISC and bear in mind that uh, the fee was, was around 200 pounds. So this, this is 100 pounds worth of free ticket to ISC. Congratulations. Next thank, month, we will announce another winner. Thank so, you very much. Uh, thank you. Okay. So I think uh, if we have no more I would like to thank our participants and our speakers, Deborah, uh, Steve from Australia, uh, Solomon, Arzu, and uh, Sandeep. And if you have registered for these meetups, it's very easy. It takes five seconds. And you can actually register for all future meetups as well. Going to be last Sunday of uh, every month. Uh, and we will alternate the time to accommodate various zones. So the next meetup will be at five o'clock UK time. So five o'clock UK time or 11 a.m. UK time. And we are going to alternate to accommodate our colleagues from Australia and, and other places. So thank you very much all for joining. And um, if you have any questions, drop me an email. Yeah. There, there's, there is a question from Sam. Yes. If you have time. Okay, right. Uh, okay, sorry, I missed that. Thank you very much all for this. This is Dan Taki asking. Yes. I have a question to all speakers regarding their blockchain organization. What have been the greatest challenge to upscale your organization since you developed it? Um, I have, is Steve still here? I will take Steve and Sandeep first and then I will answer in the end. Uh, yeah, from, from my perspective, the, same, the, the biggest challenge has been uh, people understanding other people's contexts. I mean, it's, it, it's the case that the, the advantage I had coming into this organisation was uh, I'd, I'd been outside of this organisation to a lot of people and building relationships for three years. So I brought those relationships into the association as opposed to the other way around. And in the 14 months since I've been in this role, I've spoken to no fewer than, it sounds ridiculous, 3,000 people. So it's just getting across conversations and just sort of getting people to understand where the dots are connected. So that's the most difficult thing is you need high touch quality conversations much more than um, sort of talking at people. So that, that's the biggest difficulty, I think, across these associations is how many people you need to get across. 
Yeah, I think I think I think uh, we have to we have to uh, uh, finding people actually, uh, who understand the, the technology, who are good at uh, you know implementing and uh, showing that things work. Uh, those kind of things uh, are very difficult uh, to grow. Uh, the other thing, as I mentioned before, that getting the buy-ins from the prospective users is often uh, uh, there is a lot of friction. So I think that is how it is. Yeah, I think I think I agree with Sandeep. The biggest challenge I think is is how to how to educate. The multi, multi stakeholders. Um, we have, we are surrounded by this wealth of information, and and I have to say that the vast majority of that information is not good quality. And this is really the crux of the work that we have been doing for the past four years: yeah, educating the stakeholders, based practice, making sure the decisions are made on good quality evidence. Um, so I think for us. That has been uh, one of the challenges. But I think we are getting there. Uh, things are changing for the better. So uh, we hope that uh, this will continue to improve. Um, <clears throat> so educating and eng engaging people is the biggest challenge. That's right. Okay. Any more questions? We are facing. Let me show people out the bigger picture of blockchain technology. Yes, that's right. I think we are. All of us are in the blockchain space. So Ahmed is right. When you talk to people who have never heard of blockchain, but you know that blockchain could benefit them the most, I think bridging that gap is a big challenge because sometimes you don't even know where to start. They've never heard of the technology. We are offering them solutions and apps and dApps and DAOs and DeFi's. And, and we know that 90% of them have never not heard of it. They don't know much about it. Uh, and we are in our circles, you know, networking within our circles, talking, attending meetings. And when you go out, you realize we, there's, a, there's a lot of work that we have to do in terms of education. And if we don't do it, who else? They are not going to join a university to learn about this. Most of them won't. So this is, I'm talking about lay people. They will learn from meetups like this, from, 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 from events, uh, from social media, and and a lot of that information is noise, sometimes hype, sometimes people have their you know their own interests in whatever solution that they are proposing. So it's important, I think, to have a very neutral uh, approach to technology. Technologies can be used for good or bad. Technology on its own means nothing. And as Sandeep said, technology is the easy part. It's building the ecosystems and, and, and the networks and taking stakeholders on board. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a difficult part. So yes, I agree with that. So hope for the best. Still talking about Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think at least I would, I would say if somebody's talking about Bitcoin is better than somebody who's, who does not even talk about Bitcoin or blockchain. Most of us got to know about blockchain from Bitcoin. So hopefully with Bitcoin, they will someday learn the underlying infrastructure as well. And then the new opportunities will open up to them that this technology can do more. So um, I would not discourage who say, is, is blockchain Bitcoin? Because uh, blockchain is the underlying infrastructure. So I would, I would welcome people to learn about Bitcoin. And, and then hopefully they will learn about uh, other distributed ledgers technology solutions as well. The problem we face is that uh, there are educated people who only understand a little bit about Bitcoin. And then when whenever they hear blockchain, they say, oh, there will be so much power wasted and in environment and all that stuff. And then uh, another person, <laughs> another person with a professor who went and told some government guys that you cannot do property registration on blockchain because uh, you know, unless, uh, you know, in Bitcoin, if you cannot go back and change uh, a transaction. So when you have to update the transaction, uh, you have, uh, how will you do it? And, and this is a mis misunderstanding of the entire 
blockchain technology, but people tend to think that they understand blockchain by understanding uh, Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they always talk about old technology built in. Yeah, that's right. Um, Ahmed, you're right. And this is why I said earlier in my talk that I think it's time to, to measure the, to evaluate what we have done in the last decade. Uh, you know, a, a lot has, lot has changed. It's, it's not the same as it was in 20, 2008, 2009. And, and it is advancing at a breathtaking pace. So um, yes, it all started more than a decade ago, but a lot, lot has changed, especially in the last couple of years. Very, very rapid advancement. So I think um, um, we, have to, we have to take that into consideration as well. Absolutely. Okay, I think if, if we have no more questions, uh, thank everyone for attending and we'll uh, see you all uh, next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.